Hey guys, how's it going? Welcome to this week's recap video. I'm gonna answer questions from all of last week's videos and we can just jump right into the first one, which was root cellar update and root crop storage tips. So in that video, I just gave you a tour through our root cellar, which is kind of just a box at the moment. There's not a whole lot going on in there. Uh, finishing touches are happening, hopefully this week, hopefully the whole thing is painted and all done. Uh, but we have started to move, like all the dahlia tubers are now in there. I'm gonna move potatoes and onions either probably today or tomorrow. We've got a couple of beautiful days coming up, like 57 and 58 degrees. We got a ton of rain over the weekend, so I don't know, it's just been really gorgeous. And then I dug the rest of my carrots and beets that were out in our new garden space and I got them all packed up. Um, so I had some crates and some sand and those are also in the root cellar right now. So Julianne said you should laminate the storage condition sheet. This will make it last. Yes, I should. So Gardner Supply, I had one of my crates was from them. Uh, root storage bin, I think is what it's called. We'll link it down below, but uh, it came with instructions on how to set it up. And on the back of the instructions, there was a list of all the different crops, what temperature they like to be stored at, what humidity they like to be stored at, and all kinds of that sort of information. And I thought, oh, I gotta save this and like tack it to the wall in there so that I could have a quick reference sheet because everything prefers something a little bit different. And I'm just gonna have to like try things out and find a happy medium so that everything will coexist happily in there. Carson said, will you be trying another puppy later on for the kids to grow up with? You know, we might, I can see the kids wanting a puppy at some point. I mean, I grew up with dogs and I loved it, but I doubt we'll get one until the kids are old enough to take responsibility for taking care of it. Um, because, you know, our job and our livelihood kind of depends on our landscaping and how things look. And, you know, we trial plants and we show you guys stuff. We want to be able to give you updates. That can be a little bit more difficult if you have a dog that's naughty, <laughs> I guess. I don't know, I think it's just maybe like the mess in the grass and all that stuff. I know it's all trainable, but we just don't have the time to do that right now. And we know our limitations, I think, in, the, in that realm. Yeah, for sure. Like our time is too stretched as it is. I don't know, we'll see. I do like dogs, I grew up with them, so we'll see what happens. Uh, Lynn said that wind looked nasty. It was, it was so cold that day. Everything in the tunnel is now in the cold frame. Um, some of it's in the cold frame, like the smaller potted things and some of it is outside the cold frame, just lined up along the outside of it. But our high tunnel's gone. Like everything except for the Gothic arch trellis that was in front of the cut flower space, everything's gone. <laughs> it looks weird. Uh, did the trees all get planted? No, <laughs> they didn't. They're still in their pots. I mean, we've planted some, but we have a lot left. Question, do you have doors between garage bays or do you have to open the big doors to go from bay to bay? No, there's access to each one of the bays inside the barn. Even when the studio's done, there will be a door between that bay or the studio and the middle bay of the garage. Java Mate said maybe a camera in the cellar activated by movement could be extra peace of mind in case the cats or critters made their way in, or kids. That's definitely something that we will that's look into. Idea. Yeah, I think that's a really good idea. I mean, uh, I don't know. You can say up and down that it'll never happen and you're you know diligent enough to look, but things happen really quickly or you know you get distracted or whatever so it would be a good idea ashley said where are your crates from link them soon so i used two different types of crates the first one was from gardener supply and it was actually specifically built for root crop storage um, and that was kind of like the thinner metal frame and then the other one was a big black crate that we got some of our color blends bulbs in and we typically get a huge order in from color blends which i'm thankful for this year especially and I'm kicking myself that I didn't save crates from last year because they work so well to store dahlias, gladiolus. Um, you could do, you know, I did carrots in this one. I could do all my potatoes and onions in crates like that too. And they stack so nicely. <laughs> so I feel like I got a twofer with the bulb order from Color Blends. I got the, the bulbs and I got the crates. But the most important part is just to make sure whatever you're storing them in is breathable. You can't put them in like a solid Rubbermaid tote where there's no air exchange. There needs to be holes or something like that in the sides. So yeah, we'll link the Gardner Supply one down below though. Uh, Marcia said, why Idaho? Just curious. Did I talk about that in that video or is that like a lingering question from, from the, last the last recap? We talked about how we were kind of looking at places in Idaho and honestly, like here are our reasons for wanting to possibly move to Idaho. We are right on the border. Like if we look one direction, we can see Idaho from our house. Like it's two miles, one, one mile, yeah, maybe. 
So we feel like we're already part of Idaho because we don't get Oregon papers, we don't get Oregon broadcasting, we don't get any of that. We get all lumped into Idaho except for taxes and like business regulation. And that's kind of two of our, well, there's three, three bigger reasons. One, taxes in Idaho are like better than Oregon. Um, government regulation and business is not as intense in Idaho. And one of our main things is we have a hard time getting landscapers out to do anything because we're such a small area and then you have to travel so far into Oregon for the rest of the areas, I keep hitting this plant, um, that nobody wants to get an Oregon landscaper's license that's, that lives on the Idaho side because there's so much red tape that's involved. It's really hard to get your license here. So we have like, a, like two people <laughs> that we can call from and they are so swamped and they are so expensive um, because I mean the demand here, I mean I feel like somebody could come here and like, somebody wants to come here and start a landscaping business in Oregon just in our area like we could keep you busy most of the time and we could give you a slew of other customers um, because they're just backing uphill for the few people who will actually do it in our area so in Idaho it's a lot easier for you to get your license so there's a lot more people to choose from that can come help you also there are a lot more school options for Benjamin and as we and our baby too but Benjamin's closer to that age I mean we're only like two years out less no two about two years out from um, deciding what we want to do for Benjamin's edu education and we just want to have as many options as possible so that's kind of our main reason at the moment I don't know you know who knows if it will ever happen my parents will always be here in Oregon they'll always have I mean I can't anticipate them ever leaving your parents will probably move and that's really the last of our family that are here. That, oh, fourth reason, most of our family lives over there. All of our siblings live over there. His parents will probably eventually move over there. So we'll be like, us and my parents will be the last holdouts over here in Oregon. So anyway. There's also something, I don't know, romantic about the idea of starting fresh, like starting with a new piece of a land. Blank slate. It's overwhelming to me it's too, but it's almost more overwhelming to deal with infrastructure that somebody else set up that wasn't your vision or your dream. And I feel like we've done pretty good here and I'm thankful for what the previous owners did. They did some beautiful things, but there's also like some things that I don't love. And I think you'll find that with any house that's already built. I mean, nothing's gonna be 100% to your exact taste. Um, but I don't know, it's just something we talk about occasionally, look at land online, go drive and look at pieces of land and dream a little bit. Who knows? Okay, and so moving on to the next video is drying flowers with silica gel crystals. And then I did a crafty framed project with them. Uh, and so I just wanted to show you the difference between what a pressed flower looks like, like traditional pressing method versus drying them in silica gel crystals because you get a completely different look. And um, I don't know, I have just been experimenting with that method maybe over the last year and a half, two years or so. And I used or showed flowers in that video and used a couple that I, I dried over a year ago and they maintain their color, they maintain their shape, they're amazing. Um, I wish I wouldn't have left the dahlias in that, that silica gel though for as long as I did before we actually filmed the video because they had dried out a little bit too much. Um, something that you learn along the way. Uh, JB said, do you think this will work with orchids? I have no idea, I've never tried that before. I mean, it's worth a shot. Those are very high in moisture content so it would be interesting. Uh, Serge says, is silica environmentally friendly? Um, I don't think it's particularly, like I don't know exactly, but I don't think it's particularly environmentally friendly, except for the fact that I can reuse it over and over and over again. I mean, in an indefinite amount of times. It's kind of like buying Tupperware. Like it's plastic, plastic's not great for the environment, but we use it for like our entire lives. Like the same set stays with you your entire life if you can keep the lids, keep track of all the lids. Um, so I never really feel too bad about that because it's something that I can continually use. Uh, Emma said, how long should the fresh cut flowers stay in the silica gel sand before framing them up? It'll depend on the type of flower. And like I said, the dahlias I left in for far too long. I think it had been close to three weeks, which I think they were probably done in seven to 10 days in the sand. So the longer they stay, the more they dry out and it can be hard. I mean, you saw some of the petals fall off and I think that wouldn't have happened. Um, well, one, if I wasn't hurrying, and two, if they weren't as dried out as they were. So I usually start checking flowers after about a week, uh, maybe even like after three or four days for really thin flowers, like pansies, don't take very long at all. 
Uh, and then you can kind of start to learn and gauge depending on what you're putting in there, how long it will take. Jay Lee said, I'm definitely going to try this. Do white flowers stay white when dried this way? Or do they brown some like pressed white flowers do? Now, I had a couple of ranunculus that I had planted this spring and I uh, dried a couple of those flowers and they did get creamy. They didn't get brown, but they didn't stay the bright white either. They just got kind of a creamy white color and I thought it was very pretty. It looked antiqued without looking old, if that makes sense. Meredith said, can we all just recognize that cordless hot glue gun? <laughs> what rock have I been living under? Uh, what brand is that glue gun, Laura? I will try to find the brand. One of you guys, I think Linda, I think that might be her name. I apologize if that's not your name. Send that hot glue gun out to us. We opened it in a mail time. I didn't know that cordless ones existed <laughs> either. I was living under a rock as well, and that thing has been so amazing, and it lasts forever, like a charge lasts for a really long time. Um, so I've, I've used it for several projects. I've probably charged it twice since I got it, and I got it early this season, so it has been amazing. Anyway, I'll try to link it down below. Uh, next video was Eat, Drink, and Be Merry. We did a succulent pot in a pot, which is just a like a top-down, kind of arrangement of succulents like it looks really pretty if you look at it from up above and you can do some really neat arrangements i saw that uh, mug at joanne craft store when i was there like maybe the day before and i thought oh that would be so cute and such a fun like simple thing i did use a lot of plants but you definitely don't need to use that many you could do something a little bit smaller um but i think it turned out really fun i think we might take that one down to the garden center we should do that yeah, yeah. Uh, Ev said, are there any succulents you wouldn't use for an arrangement like this? Yes. So anything that stands up too vertically, because you kind of want it to look flat, you know, when you look down at it. So if you plant something like um, some type of Crassula or uh, Senecio, like the chalk fingers that want to stand straight up, that wouldn't look as pretty because especially if you looked at it from like normal, <laughs> you would see a bunch of flat succulents and then something sticking straight up. And I'm sure you could incorporate things if you did it a little bit more mounded, but I would stick mainly to flatter type things. Christian said, love the channel. Where did you end up putting the arrangement? So yeah, we might take it down to the garden center. Right now it's on our kitchen island. We've been enjoying it for the last week or however many days it's been since we did that project. Um, but we thought that would be a fun one because I just planted up some amaryllis for the kitchen island. <laughs> so we'll probably take that down to the garden center sometime this week. Uh, Nicole said, how do we tag you to see ours? I did mine a few hours ago and want to show you. Um, so the best way to do that is on Instagram. Honestly, if you post your picture and then tag me in it, then I see most all of those. Um, there's no other way really though, is there, Erin? Because we've- tagged on Facebook too. Yeah, I don't see those. Yeah. I don't see anything that I'm tagged in on Facebook. Um, and we don't have photos on our our page, right? It just right. got it, like kind of out of control Yeah. a little bit. Yeah, we disabled that feature on our Facebook page because it started to like kind of drown everything out because there were so many photos being posted, which is really fun, but then it gets to a point where it gets to be a little bit too much. Um, so Instagram is the best place to do that. And I would love to see, so I hope you do tag me. Uh, Megan said, if I accidentally touch the succulent and mess up the powdery coating, does it eventually heal itself and put a new coat on? or are you just stuck with fingerprints on your plants? So I talked about there are some like Echeverias, um, some like Graptivarias, I think. There's probably some other things that form this kind of powdery coating on their leaves. And it's beautiful and it adds so much to the aesthetic of the plant. When you touch it with your fingers or brush against it on accident, it leaves a mark through that powdery coating. And you know, we've talked to some of the companies that we have ordered succulents from and they say that it usually heals itself in like two weeks. I've never experienced that. It might heal itself over time, like a, a great a great amount of time, <laughs> but not two weeks. And it does ruin the aesthetic of the plant to me. Like I, I pass over succulents that have, because I can tell I used to be one of those people who would walk through a garden center and just touch everything. Like, oh, this was a pretty plant. And then I learned eventually that I'm like wrecking those succulents when I do that. And so I pass over those succulents when I see them because I just know they're not gonna rebound as quickly as I would like them to. Okay, next video was 11 berry filled plants for a beautiful winter landscape. And that one was really fun. I love to do plant lists like that because it gets me so excited. Like <laughs> I have a huge list of plants now and I, I've been kind of like sketching different areas out of my garden already. 
um, like because we've had a bunch of rain this past weekend so I had some time to plan and so I'm already popping some of these shrubs in those plants and I'm so excited about it. Um, I had done a fall arrangement where I walked through the garden and I was just noticing all the different areas where I was lacking some of that fall going into winter interest and berries just add so much. So anyway, we went through 11 different categories of berry filled plants. Uh, Doc Marmalade said, are any of the berries safe for people to eat? I'm trying to remember all the different ones. I wouldn't eat any of the ones I talked about, except for like in the category of crab apples, if you were planting an edible type over an ornamental type. I mean, obviously you can eat those type of crab apples, but I didn't touch on any of those varieties. I think most of them are just ornamental to be looked at in the landscape and birds like to eat them. Angela said, would a lollipop crab apple do well in a pot? Yes, yes, it would do amazing if you had a big enough container. In fact, I meant to pick up two lollipop crab apples for our front estate planters, you know, the big black square ones. I meant to do that this spring and I had a plan on what I wanted to put underneath them and I was so excited and then I completely forgot about it and they were sold out. Um, but they would look amazing in a container. Um, how large of a pot would you need? Probably as large of a pot as your space could handle. Um, that's the only way you'll get a tree like that to survive for a lot of years happily. Blake said, where did your pink lemonade lemon go? I can't spot it in its usual spot. It's right there. See it behind me? It's doing great. It had aphids this summer. So we moved it outside. I sprayed it with spinosad with Captain Jack's and then it lived outside in kind of a semi-shaded spot. Like it was kind of like tipped over a little bit. Do you remember Erin? Like it never, uh, we just kind of like plunked it down one day. I, I sprayed it down and then it just stayed there for the rest of the season and it's rebounded beautifully. And there's like, I don't know, a dozen, a dozen lemons on there maybe. And the lime, somebody else asked a li where the lime was and I don't know if you can see it, but it's right here on the floor next to me. No, this isn't a lime, this is a lemon. My lime tree, I know you probably can't see, it's right in front of me and there are a bunch. Five, six, seven, eight, 21 limes on it right now. It's amazing. They're all kind of like this size right now. Grace said, have you thought of any other alternatives to lawns? I've uh, heard of clovers and thyme, but don't know what the best option is. I think it'll depend on your climate and where you live. Um, and what kind of light situation you have in the area where you want a lawn alternative. I don't typically um, think about that because I don't love the look of lawn alternatives. I like grass lawns. Um, I'm a huge fan of grass. I think it's beautiful and it's peaceful to look at. I can totally understand though why people would want a grass alternative for sure. Um, you know, if you do a thyme, something, uh, thyme or clover, you're going to have pollinators coming in, which is really nice. You'll also have, um, you'll have less watering, less maintenance, things like that. I totally understand it, but I am just a grass lover, so I just don't usually think about it. Lisa said, do you have a script or just that much knowledge about all the different plants you mentioned? Um, I do like a bullet point list. If I'm doing a video like that, where I'm talking about so many different things, I'll usually do a bullet point list, mostly to list down the plant size and zone. And that's pretty much it. Um, I usually don't have any other notes written down anywhere. I never have anything in front of me telling me what to say, um, but I have a hard time remembering zones and specific sizes because when you talk about, I don't know how many exact varieties I talked about in that video, but there was a lot and I could get confused really easy. In fact, sometimes we have to put a little thing on the screen saying like, I messed up, <laughs> like this is a different zone or whatever, it happens. Monica said, Laura, when speaking about the viburnum, you said some need a pollinator nearby to bloom. What constitutes nearby within 50 feet, typically? I live in on one acre lot and my neighbors have several viburnums, yet um, I only have one. Is next door nearby enough? Most likely. Usually they'll tell you within 50 feet. So if you can figure out how far your viburnum is away from your neighbors, I mean, if you're not getting berries, then you'll know like, okay, I need to put a male variety somewhere closer. Um, but as long as they're close enough, I don't know, I think you're probably okay. All right, so the last video from this week was a lemon cypress indoor care guide. And the reason we put that one together is because I was moving all of my lemon cypress inside, which I've got eight in here, most of which are two or, th or three years old. I've wintered them over that long, which is so fun. Um, and I just thought, you know what? I should put together a care guide because this has been a finicky one for me. I've had a hard time figuring out how to keep these things alive and happy. So I wanted to share what I've learned throughout the years. I mean, I took care of them a lot down at the garden center when I was in charge of houseplants and I've killed my fair share, um, but I've been pretty, had pretty good success over the last several years. So anyway, we just went through several tips in that video. Um, and also 
Since then, we have moved out a few other plants and I'm getting ready to do a Christmas tree in here. I'm so excited. Uh, Amber said, do they need it to be direct sunlight or just a sunny, bright room? In the winter time, I would say as direct of sunlight as you could give this plant, the better. Um, so if you can put it up, up next to a window that gets full on sun, they're gonna be so happy. But if you have a spot that's just really bright, I think you could get away with that as well. Just make sure to keep rotating your plant should do that anyway, even in a sunny spot, and that way you can get even growth on all sides. Sunsets and beaches say, do they have any larger varieties of this? Yes. Um, so there's like a dwarf variety, which is typically what you find, you know, at um, this time of year in topiary form. And then there's other ones, and I can't remember the names. They're not hardy here, so I, I'm not super up on the variety names of what they are, but they'll get like 16 feet tall, I think is like the most common and several feet wide. And they're really good for hedging and uh, specimen plants and things like that. And then I think there are some that get even taller than that. But yeah, they do come in larger sizes. Maria said, what type of white stones are those in the pot? Uh, they're just regular decorative white stones. I picked them up down at the garden center. They were in a bag, I don't know, like one inch size or so. I don't use them very often, but I thought it'd be fun to do different uh, styles of top dress. So I use like some aquarium stones and some white stones. I used, did I use moss in any? Oh no, I used some larger stones and pine cones and others. It's just kind of fun to have some variants. Uh, Jill said, can you use wilt stop indoors on a live plant? Yes, you can. Um, it does have a fairly strong smell. It's made out of pine resin. Um, so it's pine-ish. It's not like a bad smell, but it's fairly strong for a little bit. Um, but it does help like, I honestly, I could have used it on these and maybe I still should. Like every time I prune on these, I'll probably spray them with wilt stop. That's a really good suggestion. So thank you, I just completely forgot. It just helps with moisture loss. Um, so a lot of people use it on like their Christmas trees. If they're doing a live Christmas tree or a um, cut Christmas tree, it helps them not dry out as quickly and helps protect them. So yeah, it's something I'll probably do as I prune on these this season. Uh, Patricia said, are they okay to keep near cats? Yes, my cats don't bother plants. So I hardly ever think about plant toxicity, which I know is bad. I need to start thinking about that because I know that a lot of animals do want to bother plants. I don't believe these are toxic to cats. So I don't think they're on any list that make them toxic to like dogs or cats. And the last question is from Monica. I love the stone pedestal that sits near your daybed on the porch. Where is it from? I'm guessing this one right here. This is from Unique Stone. It's one of the pillars we got in like early this spring and I love it. I actually got two this size and two the smaller size so I could do a couple of groupings. They're really handy to have around, especially if you've got a lot of house plants. And I also use them, like I use them inside for house plants and I also use them for lamps inside. They're really, really nice and handy because they're so skinny and you can fit them in little tight areas like this. And that's it, you guys. That's this week's recap video. Thank you so much for all the questions. Um, we will probably be gearing up to do a lot more holiday decorating in the next few weeks. I'm really looking forward to it. We're getting all of our greens in the beginning of next week. So we'll have some fun stuff coming up. And then of course our week having such nice weather, I'm actually gonna go do some planting, which Aaron's probably like, uh, cause he knows he has to come follow me around and dig holes for me. Um, but I just wanna take advantage of every opportunity that we have. So we'll have some fun stuff coming up. So thank you guys so much. I hope you're having a great day and a great week and we will see you in the next video. Bye.